Awesome. Um, so we have a great topic for our first PD webinar of the year, um, Communicating the Value of Information Literacy Instruction. I'm really thrilled to introduce our presenters, Danny Brecker and Kevin Michael Klipfel. Danny is the Instructional Design and Technology Librarian at the Claremont College's Library, and Kevin is the Information Literacy Coordinator at CSU Chico. Both are graduates of UNC's Library School and the co-authors of the brilliant blog, Rule Number One, um, which I encourage you all to check out after today's event for really refreshing new perspectives on librarianship and specifically uh, information literacy instruction. So um, with that said, I'll pass it off to you, Danny and Kevin. I'll be hanging here on the line if you need anything. Okay. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you so much for the great introduction and for having us here today. And thank you to everyone who's attending, taking time out of your day to be here with us. We're really excited to be here. Um, so today's topic is communicating the value of information literacy instruction. So they have a lot of different things that we could potentially unpack here, communication, value, how we might go about instruction. And what we're really going to focus on today is the communication portion of this. So how do we tell our various stakeholders that what we're doing is important? We know what we're doing is important. We need to make sure that we can communicate that to the other people surrounding us. Um, so first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the two of us. So um, I'm on the left and Kevin is on the right. So again, um, I, we're both graduates of UNC Chapel Hills Library School. I also have an AB from the University of Chicago in English Literature, and my professional background is actually in academic publishing. Um, I am Kevin, and uh, my background uh, prior to becoming a librarian is I actually had a master's degree in philosophy, uh, and after I graduated from Virginia Tech with that degree, I taught philosophy uh, at the university level for about four years. So I think a lot of my perspective on librarianship uh, is informed by that uh, philosophical background. Um, as, as Danny mentioned, we both are graduates from the University of North Carolina's library school. Uh, we worked together um, at the undergraduate library there doing reference and information literacy instruction. And Danny and I stuck up a friendship while we worked there. We were both really interested in discussing educational theory and different kinds of ways we could connect with students in the classroom to teach them information literacy. Um, and once we graduated and moved into our professional careers, we were looking for a way to kind of keep that professional communication going. Um, so for that reason, uh, we started uh, our blog. Um, so right, so We'll talk more about the blog actually in a little bit um, towards the end of this presentation and how we'd like to continue this conversation that we have today there. Um, we also wanted to tell you about a few other things that, that are going to inform our presentation today. So we have an upcoming article called Instruction Librarians and in Education Training, a Shared Perspective, which will be in the next issue of Communications and Information Literacy. And then Kevin has a couple of things coming out also. Yeah, so I have um, this publication forthcoming um, in college and research libraries, and it's really focused on uh, new ways we can engage in student-centered teaching uh, in the classroom specifically related to information literacy instruction. Um, and some of what we talk about today when we're trying to give practical examples of communicating with faculty in the classroom will be drawn from this piece. Um, I also have another article forthcoming in Reference Services Review which uh, gives some empirical data um, informing uh, the perspectives that we will be offering today. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. So enough about us and back to the matter at hand. So what are we hoping to accomplish today? So we would like to provide you with a theoretical framework to approach communicating with faculty about the value of what we do as information literacy librarians. So we're going to use the word faculty a lot today because we both work in higher education. And the people that we often have to convince um, of our value coming into the classroom are faculty members. However, I think, and I think Kevin agrees, that um, what we're talking about today could be used in school libraries to talk with teachers about when you might have library instruction, um, if that's you know, point of need or, or any time really. 
Um, I also have a, a slight background in public libraries, and I think that this could also be interesting to think about how these applications might apply to talking about having information literacy courses um, in a public library and how you might express that to an administrator. So uh, just a word about, about the word choice that we're going to be using today. So after we create this framework, we're going to offer you some concrete examples of how we put that theory into practice. We've got some empirical data that supports our approach, and then we want to make sure that we have plenty of time to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. So this is sort of the central, central premise for today's talk, which is that a central challenge for teaching librarians is articulating the practical ways that we can help students develop critical thinking and information literacy skills in the classroom. So how can we communicate to others how we're going to help their students. There's no rule book for how to do this, and it's really hard. Um, so we're going to try and address this challenge, particularly the part about articulating the practical ways. So one way that we might approach this is to say that collaboration is key. If you can collaborate with other people on your campuses, in your schools, et cetera, um, you're more likely to have success. Um, if we could boil it down to one thing, I think this would be it. Um, but building those collaborations and being able to get yourself into these spaces where that can happen um, is not easy. So how can we go about doing that? So the reason it's not easy is that there are absolutely roadblocks. So we'll talk about two of those main ones now. So the first major obstacle is that most information literacy instruction requires that stakeholders give up class time for librarians to teach. So in the higher education setting, we usually come into the classroom during a normally scheduled classroom class time, and we deliver our library instruction. That means that during that time, the curriculum that the faculty member would otherwise teach is not going to be covered. Um, so we have to demonstrate to them that what we're doing is of equal value, it's going to help their students, um, and that that time is really well spent. And I imagine that that's similar in, in school classrooms as well, um, but I'd love to hear more about that. So the second obstacle is that stakeholders may not really understand what we do. So this is sort of an extreme example of a dapper early 20th century librarian. Um, he's doing something with the card catalog, but I mean, to some degree, I think uh, people don't really have a good understanding of what information literacy librarians do. They understand sort of the more traditional librarianship. Um, they understand collections. They understand circulation, but information literacy uh, not always not always clear to them. And I can tell you, as a relatively recent librarian, that when I tell people I'm the instructional design and technology librarian, they just kind of look at me like, you do what exactly? Um, so it's very important to be able to articulate what it is that I'm doing um, so that I can get into the classroom and accomplish these information literacy goals. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Kevin now, and he's going to talk to you more about our approach to overcoming these obstacles. Thanks, Danny. Um, so I think our approach to overcoming these, these pretty difficult obstacles uh, is really drawn from uh, student-centered pedagogy. I think we all know uh, that student-centered pedagogy uh, is good pedagogy, and we've tried to transfer that approach to working with our students to also working with uh, our faculty. So kind of a the summary of what student-centered pedagogy is, is it's really about understanding students from their perspective within their own internal frame of reference, right? It's much less about imposing certain uh, ideas or values uh, on our students from the outside uh, and really trying to understand empathetically where the student is coming from. Um, this can be cognitively with uh, how students learn. It can be effectively uh, in terms of what motivates students, uh, what interests them, who are they as people. And then from that, uh, tailoring our instruction in our curriculum um, content accordingly to, and to connect with how students learn, to connect with what motivates students. And we have really adopted 
um, this kind of idea to what we have called a faculty-centered approach to collaborating uh, to embed information literacy instruction into uh, the curriculum. So what we mean by faculty-centered is just like student-centered, uh, it's not about imposing these ideals of, say, information literacy onto faculty from the outside. Rather, what we want to do is, from within the faculty member's internal frame of reference, uh, really just understand from the faculty member's own perspective, well, what's important to them in the classroom, right? What problems, for example, are their students facing with research? And I think if we think about what are our stakeholders, our faculty, the teachers in our schools, what do they care about uh, from librarians? It's, it's they want their students to do good research, and uh, librarians have an opportunity to assist faculty with what they care about, students doing good research. So our approach draws from that student-centered uh, tradition and looks at faculty collaboration from what we might call faculty-centered uh, perspective. So this really involves uh, visually <laughs> putting, putting ourselves in our faculty members' shoes and supporting their autonomy, right? Uh, allowing them to be self-directing in their own classrooms, but us uh, meeting them where they are at. So a central question we might ask ourselves when trying to figure out how can we collaborate with faculty? How can we articulate very concretely the value of information literacy instruction is to ask ourselves, well, how can information literacy help our faculty members, help our stakeholders uh, achieve in the classroom these goals that they care about? Um, and we have found that the student-centered uh, and faculty-centered approach has been much more successful than what we might uh, refer to as a controlling style, uh, where a controlling style uh, which imposes what we care about from the outside and not taking into account the faculty member's perspective. Uh, so instead of asking, for example, how can I incorporate information literacy into your course, we ask, a different question. We ask, well, what's important to you and how can we help? And this, I think, paves the way for real, authentic uh, collaboration between librarians and faculty um, as equals. So from within that, from within that uh, perspective, we're faced with this very practical, concrete thing of, okay, we're wanting to uh, collaborate with faculty. We want to collaborate from within their own frame of reference, just like we want to collaborate with students from their own frame of reference. But how do you get those communications going? Uh, and especially if you can't say, uh, hey, you know, I'm trying to, I was hired to incorporate information literacy into the curriculum. It's really important. Uh, please help me. Because even if faculty members think information literacy is important, and in my experience, they almost universally do, they still do, as we mentioned, have their own classes to teach. Um, so it's really up to us to meet them uh, where they are at. Um, and I think what this involves practically um, is from within uh, faculty members' own frame of reference, figuring out what they care about, specific problems that faculty may be having uh, with their students doing research, and offering creative solutions uh, to those specific problems. And uh, I think something that's interesting to think about is that those creative solutions to these concrete problems that faculty are facing in the classroom with their students doing research need not necessarily be uh, problems that, or solutions that faculty think that librarians can offer, right? we do much more beyond what faculty can even maybe conceptualize themselves not being librarians. Um, we can be creative. We can, in a way, define our own uh, terms by offering solutions that faculty members may not uh, themselves even have thought of. 
And some of our concrete examples today will be uh, precisely examples of that. Creative solutions we think <laughs> that uh, we thought of that faculty may never have envisioned librarians to offer, but were welcomed uh, into their classrooms. Um, so one way of conceiving of librarians' identities as uh, educators who offer creative solutions that faculty may not themselves uh, have thought of is something that I have drawn uh, from my background in philosophy. And the way I think about this uh, is drawn from uh, the 20th century French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, Sartre is very famous for having defined uh, existentialism with the uh, slogan that existence precedes essence. And in effect, what Sartre means by this is that we as human beings do not uh, have any predefined meaning to our lives given to us, right? This gives us the freedom to choose uh, who we want to be and to define our own selves in our lives through our own unique individual choices. How this relates to librarianship uh, is that I conceive of the librarian in this sense as a bona fide existential hero. Uh, whereas a bona fide existential hero in the sense that existential heroes in literature, uh, in Camus, in uh, things like that, are people who do not allow external expectations of who they are determine how they uh, conduct themselves. So the way I think of librarians as existential heroes is we don't necessarily let other people define uh, our terms. We don't uh, acquiesce to faculty requests to say teach, you know, 97 databases. Um, what we do is offer creative solutions to uh, problems faculty have. And in a real way, I do think um, that librarians do whatever librarians say they do, obviously within certain constraints. Uh, within a course curriculum, within what faculty want, we aren't just defined by external expectations. We're able, uh, if we're creative, to um, create our own educational context by offering solutions to problems that may not necessarily be within what are the traditional expectations uh, of librarianship. So we're going to give a few okay. concrete examples of what we mean by that here on out. Perfect. So I'm going to provide the first example, which comes from this sample assignment, which I think probably people have seen something like this many times before, where the student needs to find X number of secondary sources that are scholarly. They maybe need some popular sources also, um, and they're coming to the library in order to find these sources. Um, so the expectation is sort of that we'll teach basic evaluation skills um, of how to tell the difference between a scholarly source and a popular source. Um, so I was talking to this faculty member, and they said, you know, my students, they're pretty good at identifying these things, but they're not, like, really good at using them, right? They come to the library, um, and they can find seven scholarly sources because I show them Academic Search Premier, they hit the scholarly sources only button and they're good to go. Um, so the question then that we should ask is why? So why do they need scholarly secondary sources? And the answer is I think um, that they need something that they can build their argument off of, um, that they need something that's reliable. The faculty cares about the reliability of the source. Um, it's not enough that it's a scholarly source, but it has to um, come from uh, a place of knowledge and has to engage with the other literature. And then students have to do this really sophisticated thing of um, incorporating these sources that they find into their own new argument. Um, so one thing that, that um, sometimes happens, and Kevin, I think you've seen this as well, is that students will find these seven secondary sources. They're like, check, I got it. They incorporate them into the first paragraph of their 10-page essay, and then they don't really come back to those sources. They make a lot of other claims, but they may not return to those sources. 
So as a librarian, I said, well, I think that maybe we can address this by thinking a little bit more about what these sources mean. So we did this session um, where we found some scholarly sources, but I also provided the students with five articles, and I split them up into five groups. Um, so this particular class was about Radiohead, so I gave them a blog post, I gave them a scholarly article, I gave them a review of the album, I gave them a news article, and I gave them a profile piece um, that was about the, the lead singer of the band. So the first thing I had them do was look briefly at the articles that I gave them and then summarize it a little bit um, and then figure out, is there a purpose to this article? Um, is it trying to accomplish anything? So the next step then is to figure out, is what it's trying to accomplish in any way related to what I'm trying to do? So I could maybe retrieve all five of these things through a Google Scholar search, through a Google search, but which of them are A, reliable, and B, will help me establish or um, complete the burden of proof that I need to make my argument. So the second part of this exercise is I give the students a claim. So in this case, the public response to this album was colored by the public's strong opinion and memory of the band's previous albums. And ask them, does the thing that you found actually have anything to do with this? And only two of the, two of the sources that I gave them actually did. Um, so they had to think critically about what these articles were doing and then um, figure out, like, if you were to write a paper about this, where in this article is it doing this that's related to my claim? And this isn't really something that I think faculty think librarians do, but it's totally important to what we do because it's not enough to just find sources. We actually have to, to, to use them as a key component of research. Um, so um, I think that that's an example of this sort of existential idea of the librarian can maybe um, do things that are, are different than what are expected and really useful. And one outcome of this exercise was the faculty saying, you know, gee, I didn't know that my students thought about sources like that. So that was pretty interesting. Um, yeah. So, yeah, just to oh, follow up, I mean, I had, I was telling you about this the other day. I had a recent experience where I was talking to a faculty member and he was telling me that he was really tired of students, uh, there being this requirement, you know, to use six sources and then they use six sources in their first paragraph and then, you know, the rest of their seven page paper is unsubstantiated claims, right? So the challenge is to teach them how to learn that one of the primary reasons to use sources is to provide evidence uh, for the claims that you're making and to build an argument, right? So this really was my experience, but I knew that Danny was all, had come up with this exercise, and I mentioned and described this exercise, and it was something that this faculty member had no kind of idea that was even something that librarians could help us help him with, but it really turned out to be a uh, really demonstrate our value in this relationship. So that was my experience at an entirely different institution with that uh, exercise. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Um, okay, so how I conceptualize this then to myself is through a different metaphor. So not the librarian as existential hero, though I think that's in incredibly helpful. Um, but I'm a little bit more grounded in pop culture, I think. So my metaphor is the librarian as Q. Um, and by Q, I mean like James Bond Q and not like Star Trek Q um, for any people who might be confused in, in their nerdery. Um, so this is not something that I've ever really expressed to a faculty member or to really anybody but myself, um, but it helps me sort of figure out like what my role is. So here's how the metaphor goes. So in my mind, the student is James Bond, right? And their mission is to complete the assignment. Um, so they have to do that through whatever means possible. So M, who is currently played by Judy Dench in the, in the new Bond franchise, right, um, is sort of the, the person who sets the parameters for whatever that mission is. And so I sort of see that person as a faculty member. They say, you need to complete this research assignment go. So, but James Bond can never complete his mission without a visit to Q, who's sort of like the resident mad scientist. He needs whatever Q has to provide in that particular film. So, 
it might be an exploding pen or it might be this crazy bomb suit that he's got in this picture. Um, it could be a jetpack, who knows? Um, so I sort of see the librarian as Q. We provide that essential, the essential tools that the student needs in order to complete the assignment that's been created by the faculty member. Um, so we're an integral part of this research process in higher education, and I think in education in general. So to me, this has been, has been really helpful, and um, I hope that you find it so as well. Um, so Kevin is now going to provide you with another example. Yeah, so um, we're going to take a look at another uh, sample assignment here. So something that uh, you see a lot of research, um, you see a lot of research papers requiring uh, is that students develop, you know, a well-defined research question uh, in order to build an argument. And I mean, I, I, I tend to think that it's sort of difficult to think of uh, any research assignment that doesn't require students to develop uh, a topic or uh, develop a research question. So I think that this is one, this is a fundamental information literacy skill. Um, and uh, it's something also, in my experience, that students have an extremely difficult time doing. I think we all maybe have experiences like, well, students will say, well, I need resources on my topic. And you ask them what the topic is, and they say, well, you know, it's abortion, or something extraordinarily uh, general and vague like that. And the task is really to model for them, to show them how they can develop a research question uh, and go through that process. And that's a skill uh, that they will find useful, I think, uh, through the rest of their college career. Um, so that idea that developing a research question is something that librarians can model for students, um, often just while modeling for them how to search library databases is something that has caught my attention. Um, and also something I've noticed and I've noticed over the years uh, as a philosophy instructor, as um, as uh, a librarian is that students are often bored by their schoolwork. Uh, and when I was working with a lot of first year students, um, I would notice that, you know, students tend to engage in what I think of as satisficing behavior. So they will choose a topic that they think, um, they think satisfies the demands of the assignment, even if it doesn't happen to interest them. Um, and so I thought, you know, we could really demonstrate our value if while uh, modeling for st um, students how to develop a research question, I could also figure out a concrete strategy to develop um, students' capacity to think of uh, research questions that really express who they are, that are student-centered uh, in their focus, that allow students to be themselves in the classroom. And really just try to kind of get students to stop thinking of research or school, something that is imposed on themselves from the outside, but really um, comes from uh, an internal frame of reference. And in this kind of thinking, I've been really um, influenced by a lot of literature uh, outside of librarianship. Um, some of it comes from educational psychology. Some of it even comes from counseling psychology and philosophy. So here we have a quote that I think really sums up this student-centered approach um, to helping students uh, develop research questions. And it comes from um, these educational psychologists, Asora, Kaplan, and Roth. And they really go to find this student-centered view pretty strongly. And they say that the primary task of the teacher uh, is to try to understand students' authentic interests and goals, and then to help students understand the connection between their personal goals and interests and their schoolwork. Um, so I was looking for a way to, as a librarian, in a one-shot instruction session, figure out how could I connect students uh, and make the research process something that they were uh, authentically engaged in. Um, and I took, a, uh, I took a lot of lessons from the counseling psychologist and educational theorist Carl Rogers. 
uh, who wrote that one of his challenges in the classroom is, one, if he can discover the interest of each uh, student, and two, then his job as a teacher is not so much to tell them what to think, but rather just to be creative and put them in touch with resources. So when I read this, I was like, this is amazing, because this almost defines what librarians uh, do, right? We can discover students' interests and then feed those interests by um, helping students find resources uh, about their interests. So um, what I've called authentic learning is really about uh, the need for um, educators, whether the librarians or uh, teachers, to really take a personal interest in their students and um, discover what motivates our students. And then it's our job to just connect students uh, with stuff that interests them, to make their research a lot less like what sounds like school and more about expressing um, who those students authentically uh, are in the classroom. So what I did, and I started doing this when I was a, a graduate student at uh, North Carolina, was I developed a classroom modeling exercise for where um, when I was asked to, um, a lot of times we would be asked specifically to help students develop a research question relative to a particular assignment, or often I was just asked to model for students um, how to search library databases. So what I, would start, what I started doing was telling this personal narrative when I got into the classroom of how step by step I uh, chose the research question that I was interested in. And I would always chose something that personally interested me relative to the class assignment uh, that the students had showing them and modeling for the students how they could develop a research question that interested them, and then how they could find resources on it. So I did some research um, trying to assess two, a couple different kinds of things. One, whether in fact in a one-shot instruction session, librarians um, could influence the topics uh, students ch choose. I wanted to see whether or not uh, increased authenticity of personal topic choices, in fact, led to increased student engagement with their research. And then also, I wanted to measure whether or not um, that increased engagement, in fact, led to increased learning and information literacy skills. So I did a study with about uh, with eight different classes, 100 students. I divided them into two groups. One group, the experimental group, uh, received what I called authentic topic selection. So I modeled how relative to the class assignment to choose a topic that interests you. And in the control group, I just gave them what I would call uh, generic library instruction. So I just modeled for them with any topic um, that would fit the assignment, how to search the library databases. And the results I got from this um, were um, really exciting, I think, and have, been, have gone a long way with working with um, faculty. So here's some empirical data. Um, I, asked, I gave students uh, a Likert scale and I asked them these questions. So I had them um, rated 1 through 5. I, I agree, strongly agree, or don't agree at all basically with the item. Um, so they were out of 5, uh, 5 being they agree strongly with the statement, 0 being they disagree with the statement, and the p-values over all the way on the right just um, indicate that if it's less than 0 0.05, that these results aren't random, we can be confident that uh, authenticity is what's making a difference in these results. So even if it's within a 15-minute session, um, it seems like that authentic modeling made an enormous difference uh, with first-year English writing students uh, choosing authentic topics. And I think one thing that's interesting about this is that uh, we might automatically assume, and I've heard a lot of people say this, that, well, don't students automatically choose topics that interest them? And the data seems to show, no, they don't. Many of them just are alienated from their um, assignments. Um, I see a question that says, what if they come to the library uh, with assignments or topics uh, from their instructor? I had students walk up to me. I, I had students change their topics 
Uh, and the faculty members were totally okay with that. I had one student, I remember she walked up to the faculty member and said, uh, I realize my understanding my topic. Can I change this? So I do think that um, even if they do kind of come with pre-existing topics in their head, they are liable to change it. And uh, librarians can make a difference um, in that regard. Um, so it seems like that modeling exercise within a one-shot session uh, did lead them to choose uh, authentic topics at greater levels in the experimental group. And what was really cool is that also this seemed to increase their engagement with the research process. So I asked them certain questions that we're trying to get at their intrinsic motivation. So, for example, um, whether students cared about the finding answers to the question they were working on, whether they cared about their papers independent of the grades that they received, uh, whether they planned to work on, uh, whether they looked forward to working on their papers more in the future. And in all cases, uh, significantly, uh, students in the authentic group um, rated their engagement higher than students uh, in the control group. Uh, so being personally connected to your topic um, led to increased engagement. And this was something that librarians specifically in a one-shot session had an impact on. Um, and then I wanted to measure, well, whether or not this led to uh, student learning of emission literacy skills. And what was really interesting to me was that students in the authentic group reported to be able to find information uh, at higher levels than students in the more generic um, groups. Uh, so that was one really interesting result. Uh, we think, I think we think of the traditional uh, idea of librarians is we help students find information. And uh, helping students connect with their schoolwork in an authentic way actually allowed us to perform the um, traditional task of librarians better by offering this creative solution to uh, library instruction. So, um, and you know, I never mentioned the phrase information literacy uh, during um, my communications with faculty. Rather, I just said I have developed this way that I think helps students engage with their research. But uh, the upside of that was that it hit like four out of five major ACRL information literacy outcomes. One, that students can define and articulate their need for information. Students were able to define an authentic research question. Uh, students were able to access the information they needed. Uh, students in the experimental group actually found information at higher rates. Um, and so forth. So it's really interesting, I think, to think that we don't just need to, we can offer uh, faculty members creative solutions um, that don't necessarily say I need to incorporate information literacy, but it does end up uh, doing so. So this approach um, to working uh, with faculty that I had developed at UNC has um, been really helpful to me uh, in my capacity as the information literacy coordinator here at Cal State, Chico. Um, I was tasked, we um, did not have an information literacy coordinator when I got here. I was tasked with creating a information literacy program in effect from the ground up. So I was looking to collaborate with all um, kinds of faculty members on the Chico State campus from the English department to, um, to um, the distance learning center, to um, we have a very successful writing center on campus where students come for writing help. So I, I went to some of these groups and discussed that I was an information literacy coordinator and just sort of talked about some of my strategies with working with students uh, and getting them engaged with research. So what you have here is a screenshot of a presentation that I was asked to give um, by our Student Learning Center. They have extremely successful workshops, and I was asked to give one on information literacy. But what I was asked to do is they really liked this idea of uh, showing students how to engage uh, with their research at an authentic level. So I ended up doing a video on how I would develop a research question on my uh, favorite rapper, uh, Drake. Um, and they recorded this, and also that, that made it available um, to the Distance Learning Center. So already this very quick um, 
interaction that I had just by kind of talking about authentically engaging with students led to a lot of cross-campus collaboration um, almost immediately uh, here at Chico State. Um, another great thing that happened for um, information literacy here since I've been here is we were lucky enough uh, I, to get an article written about our new program by the local newspaper here, um, the Chico Enterprise Record. And this is a uh, quote here from myself um, that I gave to the reporter uh, at the Chico ER that I had that idea uh, that, you know, students who express who they really are in their research, uh, that librarians could help them to um, really enjoy and engage more in the school process. And this article, I think, added a lot of legitimacy to this approach to information literacy and to putting information literacy on the map at, um, at Chico State. And I think what I've been viewed as, in a lot of ways, is someone who can help engage students with research. Um, and this has led to some really great collaborations uh, with some people in the education department and all kinds of exciting things. So it was really, again, this kind of existential idea of maybe going outside of the librarian box in a way and um, just finding our own terms for uh, what librarianship uh, really can be. So I think Kevin's strategy really sets us up then to be what I would term the librarian as cool aunt or uncle. It doesn't like really matter. It's not gendered. Um, so by that I mean that we're student-centered, but we're also supporting the faculty goals. Um, so in the case that Kevin was describing, faculty wanted students to write better papers, students want to write about things that they care about, and the librarian sort of facilitates that happening. Um, I think it's also really important that we don't have usually a grading presence. Um, that sort of makes us a natural ally to both the student and the faculty. Um, it shows that we're sort of like the impartial judge. It's like when your your nephew comes up to you and says, um, you know, mom's being unfair and you can sort of like arbitrate there. Um, and I think you can also sort of show that you get it, that you understand the student's perspective. Um, you can be like a little bit more real than maybe the faculty member is who has to be in the situation of controlling the environment of the classroom um, all the time. So um, I think that this sort of puts us in this really unique and really special position, which also situates, situates us well for our last metaphor, which is the librarian as an educator. Yeah, um, so I think that uh, one of the narratives that has been going through uh, our, our presentation here um, really is that librarians uh, in defining their own role in the classroom really are legitimate educators and we need to have the confidence uh, to assert ourselves um, as such. And I think um, viewing ourselves in this way uh, really has allowed, I think, um, for real, uh, true, authentic collaboration uh, with faculty members to figure out what works best for our students, rather than just getting requests that say, hey, I'm out of town, uh, could you show them uh, JSTOR? Um, but I think also maybe that thinking of ourselves as educators uh, creates a burden for us as well. Uh, in the sense that we need to get, uh, we need to step up our game, uh, as it were, in terms of um, improving ourselves as educators. So this might mean, I think, uh, going outside of librarianship often to the education literature um, in order to think of these creative solutions. So there's so much wonderful literature in education that allows us to think of these strategies that are working in the education field and then apply them to librarianship. Um, and I think there's a, there's, there's a lot of different paths to uh, develop your educational and pedagogical knowledge. So one thing that Danny and I did during library school, and it's something I would suggest that current library school students explore, uh, is to see if you can take some coursework in the education department. Danny and I did this and we feel like it helped us immensely uh, in our working with faculty and thinking of creative solutions uh, on the job market. 
and um, things like that. Um, the blogosphere uh, has lots of different options for librarians. Our blog um, is something that we consciously started to create a space for librarians to talk about pedagogy, to talk about educational theory and how it might apply um, to librarianship. And um, we've also really, I think, found a lot of value in what we might call more popular education books. So books written by educational experts, um, but pitched to a general audience. So there's one really, I think, exemplar book in this regard um, is a book by Daniel Willingham, who's a cognitive uh, psychologist at the University of Virginia. And he wrote a book called Why Students Don't Like School. And um, that book has a lot of really awesome cognitive strategies that we can apply uh, in the classroom as librarians. And Danny and I have tried to do so a lot in our own instruction. So I think when we conceive of ourselves as educators, we realize that we can be confident in our discussions with, um, in our collaborations with faculty. And it also involves really improving ourselves um, and gaining a lot of educational um, knowledge. So but we all have put some references here um, together uh, for you. A lot of this stuff um, is pieces we've authored and uh, mentioned in the presentation. And a lot of it um, is further advice um, from other librarians who have written about collaborating with faculty. And then, of course, like Kevin said, um, we'd love it if any of you would like to continue this conversation on our blog. We'd love to have guest posts. Here's a little bit of information about where you can find it. And if you'd like to talk to us directly, here's our contact information. Um, we'd love to email with you as well. So um, feel free to get in touch. And with that, I think we'd like to move into questions, make sure that we have some time for that. So what questions do you all have? Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Danny and Kevin. That was a really uh, fascinating presentation. And the discussion that's been going on during pretty much the entire session has been really great. We've had a lot of great uh, contributions here. Um, I did see one question that I wanted to address. It was asked uh, earlier in the presentation, and I didn't find an opportunity to interject. Um, before I ask that, everyone um, who is in today's session, feel free to add any questions you may have um, as well to the chat box right now. Um, but one person had asked, can any of these exercises that you guys have suggested, uh, suggested in terms of teaching practices, um, have you ever applied them to 50-minute you know, one-shot instruction sessions, or is, are these more um, over the course of a couple different classes? I mean, that's um, uh, yeah, you want to go ahead with that? Oh, sure. Um, well, I, I'll take it first, I guess, and then Kevin, please please jump in. Um, so I think that's an excellent question. So um, I've been pretty fortunate, personally, that I usually get a whole class session, and I can usually do sort of like one thing. Um, I've also been pretty fortunate in that I, I do have the opportunity to talk with a faculty member before <clears throat> classes start, and we can talk about what would be sort of like the most important thing that they would like to see accomplished. Um, I think within 15 minutes, though, you can express some of these ideas um, that we've talked about. So, for example, picking a research topic that's interesting to you. Um, I think that you could probably model that in a 15-minute session. You may not be able to have the students do it at the same time, but I, I think, sure, you could do it. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was something that I was really concerned about, like, with that research, was showing uh, the the real significant impact that librarians can have uh, on how much students care about their work, uh, on them developing topics, on honing their research skills in a 50-minute standard uh, run-of-the-mill one-shot session. Um, so all of those, all that research, I think, was uh, done in 50-minute uh, or maybe sometimes oh. hour. Session. I think okay. the question, though, Kevin, was 15 minutes, if you just get 15 minutes of a class session. Oh, really? Right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, th th there are certain things I've done, too, where, like, uh, you can email us for, Danny, Danny put together a really awesome handout on the authentic inquiry section. Um, and I, I've just given faculty that handout and talked about it with them. and. Um, 
and uh, they can then incorporate that into their coursework. Awesome. Um, another question that we had was, um, are there places to get annotations of the latest educational findings, and how do you sort of keep up the speed with it? Some people in the chat mentioned that they use Twitter and some different hashtags, but um, in terms of just for your own um, professional knowledge and even for writing on your blog, uh, how do you guys sort of keep up to speed with um, the newest information out there? Um, so I, I read a lot of blogs, honestly, um, and I also use Twitter. Um, and I'd be happy to put together like a bibliography of, of those things. But honestly, that's probably the way I find out most about what's being published now. Um, Kevin, do you have different thoughts? No, I mean, I agree with that also. I mean, you know, sometimes I'll just Google like education and like what's the latest news, you know. Um, but I mean, that's true. Actually, like The Atlantic often reports on um, new education findings. Absolutely. Um, Scientific America is good too. Um, you know, but some ways, some, in some sense, it's just old school librarianship. We always are telling our students to citation track, right? So, I'll be, become interested in a topic, like, you know, um, do students uh, who are more engaged in their topics uh, learn more, right? Is there that connection? So I'll find one article on that, and then I'll find uh, lots of different articles on that. And I'm, you know, I'm fairly obsessive about it. I mean, it's something that I'm really passionate about. So, but I'll track in citation chain in that way. Um, also, those popular books like that, there's a new book uh, about, uh, uh, grit and curiosity, and um, how uh, I think it's by Paul Tuff uh, called "How Our Children Succeed." You know, I just happened to cross that at Barnes and Noble, and it's really great. Um, the Daniel Willingham book is a really good place to start. So those popular books, I think, are like gold mines of um, of new material. Um, but I mean, you know, something that also came up in the comments was I know that a lot of K through 12 librarians. Um, are trained as educators, and I think that they're more likely to view themselves as such. Uh, and I suspect that those folks are maybe more on top of this stuff than some other people might be. Uh, I've explicitly asked a lot of academic librarians that they conceive of themselves as educators, and almost universally they said no. Um, and I think just conceiving of yourself in that way can help you take a stronger interest in improving your pedagogical practice. Um, and developing a kind of intrinsic desire to seek that stuff out. Um, another question that we had um, that I think is a really uh, great question just because we've done um, some webinars on this in the past. Um, do either of you do any sort of activities or instruction outside of the classroom? Or to use more of a buzzword, um, do, you any, do you do any sort of flipped classroom instruction? Um, so we don't do very much flipped classroom instruction where I am. Um, we have created like some short videos and tutorials that I try to put some of these same principles into. So for example, if you're developing a topic, make sure you think about what's interesting to you and then situate that within your disciplinary area. Um, I would say that most most of the instruction that I do is I'm very engaged with active learning, so it doesn't necessarily lend itself well to the um, flipped classroom, but I don't think that that means that it can't. Um, Kevin, have you done anything with flipped classrooms? No, I definitely have not. Um, I mean, something, something uh, sort of like that, I guess, is I, just, I was just talking to New South the other and I offered her a couple, different, a couple different things we might do for the students based on the assignment that they had. And there just wasn't enough time to do them all. So I suggested, well, I have this exercise that students can do online. Uh, why don't you have them do that? And then we can talk about that as an icebreaker. Um, so something like that. But um, I don't know. I, I tend not to. I tend more, I think, to focus on uh, the literature in educational psychology that relates to cognitive psychology or uh, student motivation rather than this trend of uh, flipped classroom. But I think if you are going to engage in flip classrooms, you still use the same sort of best practices, like you wouldn't overload your, your course with too many outcomes. Um, you wouldn't have too much content. You could still do all the modeling. Um, so it really seems to me that 
that that's something that is possible. Um, one last question since we are coming up um, at to the top of the hour. Um, and I thought this was a good question just given the fact that you guys are blogging on such a regular basis. Have you worked with instructors on blogging as an academic skill in the 21st century at all? Or is that something that you kind of keep to outside of work? So that's a great question. Um, and you know, it's very interesting because in a lot of the courses that I see, they do have a blog component to their class or they do all their reflections on a blog, but I haven't actually engaged with that at all. And I think that would be really interesting um, to sort of think about like the differences between academic writing and blogging and then of course the commonalities between them because I think that that's sort of what we're exploring on our blog is sort of the intersection of those two things. Um, so I, I would be interested in looking into that, but I hadn't actually thought of it. That's a great idea. Awesome. Okay. Um, so thank you guys so much. Um, I'm just going to scroll through real quick just to see if there's any other real quick questions. Um, Lots of positive feedback here. People were saying that it was very thought-provoking um, and many, many thanks coming in. So um, just as a reminder to everyone who joined us today, um, these free uh, professional development webinars are offered uh, bi-weekly and you can sign up for the series um, at our blog, which is content.easybiv.com. Um, I will drop that in the chat box. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. And Danny and Kevin, thank you again so much. It's been a really interesting um, presentation and conversation today. And uh, Danny, I may um, take you up on that offer of sharing uh, different blogs and Twitter accounts that you followed uh, to keep up to speed with that. That's something that our participants really took an interest in. So um, we'd love to get sure, that on the blog do. as well. Absolutely. And thank you again for this opportunity. We had a great time. So, and thanks for the wonderful questions. It was great. We really appreciate it. And if you guys have questions about anything, please feel free to get in touch with us. Yes. And as a reminder, um, in addition to sending out a recording of the webinar, we will also be sending out um, today's presentation slides. And um, I believe uh, Danny and Kevin had their email addresses on there as well, although you can always reach them um, at their blog as well. So um, definitely, uh, reach out to them. They're certainly a great resource um, to leverage. So thanks again to everyone. Um, we have less than a minute left, so I will wrap it up for today. Um, take care, and hopefully we will see you in a couple of weeks at our next uh, PD webinar.